welcome to the Garage Gardeners Radio Show with your hosts, Emma and Stephen Biggs, right here on Reality Radio 101. To get on board, send us an email right now. Our email address is instudio101 at gmail.com. Welcome to the Garage Gardeners Radio Show, where we talk about extending the gardening season and pushing garden boundaries. We talk to creative gardeners and garden experts who break the rules and make new ones. Now, here are your hosts, the daughter and father duo, Emma Biggs and Stephen Biggs. Hey everyone, I'm Stephen Biggs, and thanks for hanging out with us today on the Garage Gardeners Radio Show. Emma and I think gardening is a great way to hang out together, and we're glad you're hanging out with us here. Our show is all about extending the gardening season and pushing garden boundaries. Now, Emma just texted me a shout-out to say hi to all of our listeners, and she found out yesterday that she has an in-class school assignment today that she can't miss. She didn't want to miss the show, so last night, Emma put together a fantastic tomato segment for you, and you'll hear that partway through today's show. If you want to connect with us, you can find me at stephenbiggs.ca. You'll find Emma at emmabiggs.ca soon because she just decided to rebuild her website, so it's down for about a week. On Instagram, find us hanging out as Garage Gardeners, and if you're tomato crazy, be sure to visit Emma on Instagram. She hangs out there as emmabiggs underscore grows. I'm really excited about our in-studio guest today. I first met Jesse Zhao in October when he opened up his farm for tours. But this wasn't just any old farm tour because Jesse's farm and market garden is right here in the city of Toronto. He's farming his Toronto backyard. And I left Jesse's backyard feeling inspired about his approach to growing how he's using gardening and food as a way to build community, and also by how he made a huge career change when he got into farming. So, Jesse, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, why don't we start out today just telling the listeners how you got into farming, because that was (coughs) not what you started out doing. No, no, no. I came to Canada in the expectation to grow into... um, I saw the merging of uh, the internet and television merging. And while I was in Kenya, I wanted to be in the forefront of it. And long story short, I found the only course being offered in North America. And it was at Humber College. And uh, I found this wonderful uh, guy, uh, Professor Tom Green, who uh, worked really diligently to get me here to Canada because I I didn't want to come initially. I wanted to learn it from from long distance, so I didn't want to come here. And he offered me to, why don't if, if I come and uh, study? Uh, so in 99, uh, you know, applications uh, worked out that I was able to come to Canada, and I did. And it was kind of cool times to spend time here just learning about technology and being the forefront of it. it was, it was I had a good time. I started my own tech company. Uh, we did very well. We had some good uh, businesses and projects that we got out, and uh, I got to travel because of it. I got to meet some really cool people. Um, I brush shoulders with uh, Google and those all these big tech homes and houses. Um, but something wasn't working. I wasn't feeling that I was able to accomplish, even though I accomplished the goal that I wanted to as far as merge, seeing the merging of technology, uh, TV and, 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 and media co- collide online, which is beautiful. Something wasn't really working for me. Going home, and as we were talking earlier, um, my family and my kids, I was feeling like I was not really connecting, not just connect, but feeling a sense of family togetherness and, and uh, being able to build a life of their, of together. And mm-hmm. um, a friend of mine saw this and she said, hey, there's a podcast on CBC about this guy who's doing farming in Vancouver. And I thought, okay. And so I listened to the guy. I was Michael Abelman. 
uh, who's uh, who runs uh, Soul Food Farms out in uh, the east end of Vancouver. Yes. And it blew my mind. It just completely blew my mind because everything that I was missing in the tech world was everything he was doing. And mm. it wasn't as if it was um, uh, just a, a, a business set up just to make ends meet. No, this was... If if anybody gets a chance, S O L E Farms, and you just Google it, you'll find it. And Michael Abelman is the, is the person behind it. And what I saw him doing, he was rejuvenating a city by growing food, and not just any type of food. This is market gardening, like really big time. Is is he was taking over huge stadium parking lots and. If anybody knows Vancouver East End, it's one of the toughest places yeah, in the city. It is. Uh, so you name all the druggies, all you name it all. There's needles on the floor. It's a really difficult uh, area to do anything. And But he made it work. And the people working in those gardens were those people that, that the society looked as a downtrodden. Don't want to be part of, don't want to work with you, don't want to be known, don't be associated with you. But those are the people he was working with to grow this food that he was marketing at a farmer's market selling at a premium price to other, to even to chefs and restaurants. And I thought, nobody needs a resume. You know, you don't just get your hands dirty. And, and I binged read his books all weekend. I listened to a podcast on a Thursday. I, was, I, I, I bought his book online. Mm-hmm. I read everything he wrote because I just spent the whole weekend just immersing myself into it. And by the end of it, I told my wife, this is it. I am going to make a switch. And she was in panic mode, looking at my face like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so it was that quick then? It was it? that. Because when I said it fit, it fit very well. Because to me, regenerative um, context means a lot to me. Because when in, in society, when you, have, you know, when you have an opportunity to rebuild and to, re, to bring back, to win back, so to speak, of, you know, you even though your life is the, it looks a certain direction, you can you can actually rebuild. You can actually come back. You can actually have a sense of worth. One of my favorite sayings that my friend has, uh, it's, she said it was called uh, Broken Crayon Steel Color. Mm-hmm. And this is run by um, a group that I really like support called Urban Promise Toronto. Um, and they run uh, inner city youth camp. And they she had this shirt built called Broken Crayon Steel Color. And I thought this is this is exactly what I want to see. You don't have to be prop, prim and proper, well kept to be. You can be because you are, yeah. and that was perfect. Broken crayon, still Steel color. color, very yeah. powerful. It is, it is, and I wear that religiously. I kid you not. I have I have hoodies made of with, <laughs> no, with it. I have shirts, and I wear it every day. I go farming, even when I do my deliveries, which we'll talk about later. I wear that shirt because it is the truth. You you don't have to be a perfect crayon to make color. You know you're broken. You're part of this fabric called human, mm-hmm. and you play a role. So that to me is what Michael did, mm-hmm. and that's what to me means so much when he was able to accomplish this, and actually still goes on today. Uh, and I thought this is it. I want to have a farm, and I want to grow food, and this is it. And that mm-hmm. was that was that switch, and I flipped it and I never looked back. So so tell me now, once you flip that switch. What was your next step? You'd made that decision. Um, so luckily, I had a couple. I had a friend of mine, uh, Trish, Trisha, and she um, she was working at Wilbarrow Farms. Um, uh, her and her boyfriend, and I, I wanted. I called her up and I said, I need to come see you. And I went to Wilbarrow Farms and spent a couple of times, and I just fell in love with everything about it. I mean, the, if, a gr- great group of Tony runs the, the shop there, and fantastic, fantastic setup. Um, and they do, you talk about market gardening on like big land and really well done uh, crops. He, Tony's it. Uh, CSA program's just phenomenal. They sell out like yesterday. If he puts it up, it's gone. It's very, very um, tuned in, dialed in individual. Um, so when I went and visited Trisha and I saw, when I went there, actually, this was a cool thing. I went, I wanted to spend the night with them. So when I came in, it was uh, about uh, 5 36 o'clock on a summer evening. And when I came in, they just finished uh, with that last task, and they were sitting around the fire with a with a skillet in the middle of the, of, of the fire. They had sausages and veggies, and they were all eating from there with their dandelion wine bottles. And I'm mm. thinking, this is the life. 
<laughs> so I was really intrigued by that, thinking this is the and it just uh, you know just we just finished a whole day's worth of work, but here we are, and just uh, communing and having fun together. So that really, she helped me, and Tony also helped me understand what this journey will look like. And one thing I really appreciated what he, Tony was saying is everybody's journey is different. And mm-hmm. it's it's important to know what your goals are in, before you jump into farming, just understanding um, what your trajectory is going to be. And you may not know it yet, but you have to get in it to understand it. And that was when I first heard of Curtis Stone. Okay. Yeah. And, so it, and, and he has been a big influence on you massive too. Massive influence. Oh, my goodness. Um, and it was, it was actually horrendous. So every Father's Day, I have, not Father, every Father's Day, I have a thing with my kids. I tell them Father's Day is my day. Mm-hmm. Is when I go away, and I spend time by myself. And every other day is my day with you. So hmm. they spend. I spend. I'm, I'm home a lot with them. So we we do everything. So Father's Day, they're like, "Have a good day. Enjoy your weekend away, and we'll come back and we'll hang out." So this is my day to just do my own stuff. So I have a group of friends that we meet up at a cottage and we just hang out as dads and mm-hmm. just have some dad bon- moments. Uh, but what I did that weekend was um, there was an email that came through with Curtis and he said, I was actually had connected with him on a couple of things with his course. And I was doing his online course about urban farming, which is phenomenal, which helped me to understand the business plan, understand the, the you know crop planning and, and all the details of starting a farm. Um, you know, getting contracts, getting land, and especially farming in the city because he does, uh, sorry, he did for 10 years urban farming, taking over backyards, rehabilitating them, and growing food for market mm-hmm. in Kelowna, BC. And this email came through and says, hey, I need somebody to come help me run a course in Kelowna for a week. And I responded saying, I am in and out. Let's go. I'm coming. Wow. And he said, yeah, sure, come on up. And Within a couple of days, I was in a flight and going to Kelowna, BC, to spend a week with Curtis. And and it, my goodness, the, the the way he did, the simplicity of the work he did, really um, fueled how I approach what I do today. Because he doesn't complicate his work, mm-hmm. but he fine tunes the quality of his work. So let's say going to land. I mean, how you plant, he fine tunes things that don't waste time. So weeding, for example, he rarely weeded because he had all these weed policies ahead of time. Uh. So when people are fighting with weeds in June and July, he's not doing that. He's planting and harvesting instead. Right. right. So a very smart guy, very smart guy. So yes, I do use his intellect a lot and I call him up if I have issues and such a great guy too. He's very smart mm-hmm. in what he's done. So now how many years have you been farming? Um, coming into my fourth growing season. Okay. Um, so we started to the to, uh, 2016 there, mm-hmm. and yeah, so fourth growing season, yeah. Okay. And it's uh, what a learning curve that is, my goodness, <laughs> but good, good learning curve. And your farm name? So your farm is Zawadi Farms. Yes. So we struggled. Uh, I say we because I have a colleague, a friend of mine, who uh, we met uh, before I started the farm, and he. He and I worked. He he was he was he just finished his master's. He did a master's in environmental science, mm-hmm. uh, specifically on our farms. He did a thesis about Zawadi Farm. Um, so we were struggling to find a name. What is a name that we can have and use uh, to for this name? So Zawadi is actually Swahili uh, for gift. It means gift. And the land that we have that we got the first time uh, was from a gentleman by the name of John Anga, who runs Anga's farm. And when I told him what I wanted to do, he gave me seventy five hundred square feet of free space. Hmm. And if you understand Toronto, you cannot get fifty square feet for free from anywhere. Yeah. So he gave me seventy five hundred space uh, square feet, and he said, "Grow, grow what you want to do." Wow. Just helped me around the farm, and you know, and I spent the whole season with him. And so we we just looking at I was gifted the space, mm-hmm. and everyone who's opening up their backyards is gifting me their space. I have no choice but calling it gifted farm. Beautiful, yeah. such an appropriate name. It is. I, mm. I, I'm glad it uh, it all it all worked out. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us about your business model because you're growing, but then you're getting the produce to eaters in more than one way. 
Yeah, this was a difficult one. Um, when we first started, as you understand, when I took the Credit Stone course and the, all the mentors that I had, they were very specific to market gardening. So everything you're growing, you're selling it for profit mm-hmm. because you want to make a living through it. The area that I live in it's, is uh, Rexdale, and if you if you Google it, um, if you zoom out a little bit, there are four highways that make a, a big quadrant. So we have the 400 highway and the 401 highway, and then we have the high to the four, four, the, the 27 highway, and then the highway seven up at the top. So it makes mm-hmm. a big gigantic box. That one it has one of the highest concentrations of low income homes mm-hmm. in our city. And when I started my market gardening and I went to sell my produce, the first problem I had, by the way, I started, I started also a farmer's market there. Okay. And when I went to do it, everyone who came to me was asking me, actually, well, not asking me, was telling me, I can find this produce cheaper. Hmm. And they would walk away. I'm thinking, am I doing it? I've done my research. What did I miss? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was just consistent that way. And the first day was, I, I, I got a few buyers here and there, and it was kind of okay. But still, there was a majority of them looking at the produce saying, I can find that uh, tomato cheaper. And I can find that kale cheaper. I can find that Swiss chard somewhere else. I can get this tom- onion somewhere else. And there was that same conversation. I said, this is something is really missing. And... I remember my uh, one of my friends, uh, Julianne, is, she's, she helps me with thinking. So when I have thoughts, I call her up and say, I don't, I'm having this thought. I don't understand it. What's going on? What am I not seeing? And she said, well, you just have to be crazy. Mm-hmm. You know, this, uh, and actually, it's funny. Michael Abelman, when I met him for dinner once, and he said, you need to be crazy. And I mm-hmm. want you to be crazy. And she, re- she quoted that quote back to me. So... I said, so the next time I went to market, I did this. So anyone who came to me and said, I can find that cheaper, I said, take this, go home, cook it, do whatever you need to do with it, and talk to me when you come back tomorrow or the next time I'm, I'm at the market. And I kid you not, everyone who took my produce home never asked me the cost of that pro- the product again. And they bought me. Every time they wow. came back, they bought the produce. Mm. So it was a question of uh, just understanding what um, the conversation was. It's not about the the they didn't understand why why the growing local means nothing. But once they tasted it, mm. especially my beets, I couldn't keep them on the shelf fast enough. They flew, and which was so it was it was a good opportunity for me. It was it was not a profitable year to be honest because of that journey, but mm-hmm. it was a, a perfect learning curve for us. So you were crazy in a sense because you were giving away your produce, but you bought. You didn't buy people, but you showed them then. Yeah, so that was the, the crazy one. That was the first crazy bit. And then once, so I learned about food security. So that was a big thing that I learned that day is not everyone can afford to go to a farmer's market to buy produce, mm. and especially with the low-income population that I'm around. So the second year that we started, my colleague's dad actually came and said, guys, why don't you have one box that people can come and say, give me $25 worth of produce, one shot. Mm-hmm. We'll pack that and we'll sell it. So the coming season, we did we started doing home delivery. So we said we'll just do we we'll just call our friends and family and say, hey, we're gonna grow this much of food, twenty five bucks a week. You'll get produce coming to you. You can pay bi weekly or weekly, whichever one you want, and we'll get produce coming to you every week. And the response was phenomenal. We had mm-hmm. it was great. We did very well that year. But what we what I learned was. Even though I was doing that, there's still that community that I really want to get food to. They weren't getting when oh. I was growing. Mm-hmm. So I partnered with um, an organization called Food Share Toronto. Mm-hmm. And I told them, listen, there's a community down here that I need help with. So they helped me launch a, a they call it, um, um, it's a market that you're doing with the community there. And uh, what I did with them was I could buy what I could not grow. So mangoes, um, avocados, fruits. So mm-hmm. it's fruits and veggies, like fruit, not veggies, but fruits that I can't grow myself. So I buy those and I add my produce and then I go to the community and I, I sell them for like nothing. So I use the money that Zawadi made from the CSA sales. So my mm-hmm. customers knew. So the profit or the money I'm making above that, anything extra that I've harvested goes to the community. So we take it in there. So Kayla was selling for like $3 a bunch. I could sell it for a dollar. Okay. But it's part of the harvest. So the CSA members have already paid for the produce completely. Yeah. Right? And if they want extra, they pay for extra. 
but I take the extra and subsidize it to the market. So your CSA subscription boxes are subsidizing what you're doing at the market. Then. Correct, yeah. correct. And that's really been a formula. It was a crazy formula to begin with, but so far it's worked. Nothing's changed, and it's it's really been helpful for me to be able to bring the produce to there and actually see that conversation, that bridge slowly mm. being um, closed off and opened so you can actually get in, get the food in. Wow. Mm-hmm. Hey, we had a nice email come in. Thank you, Shelly, who has emailed in. Hi, Steve. Happy New Year, Emma and your guest. And uh, Shelly loves the topic today. So thanks, Shelly, for that that shout out. I really appreciate that. And um, Eamon is sending us a Happy New Year. And he's a longtime listener from El Peso. Well, thank you very much. And, and I really appreciate the shout out. And uh, he's saying that we need more folks like your guest in urban areas there. So I, I think, I hope you're inspiring. I am. Here. This is great. Yeah. yeah Thanks, Amin. This, this is great. Well, let's talk about um, your neighbor's yards, because that was something when, <clears throat> when I first came to, uh, to see your farm, yeah. that really intrigued me that yeah. uh, not only are you doing your backyard, but it sounds like your community, you have more backyards now than you can I deal with, I actually do. Right? I'm close to having about a quarter of an acre of, of, of just collectively of backyards. Um, so this was an interesting thing. I wasn't, when I started farming, I, I was not thinking of, of taking over backyards. That was not my plan. Um, and this is what I appreciate what Tony told me was you don't know, but just, you know, just start with getting your hands dirty mm-hmm. and it will just, your plan will come up. So what we, what it did was um, I was farming. I just built my greenhouse in my backyard. I just started farming, and my neighbor um, that previous year lost her husband, and uh, he was a fantastic gardener. And I, I, one of the major regrets I have right now is the, he was an Italian backyard gardener. And if you understand, oh. they were geniuses, in, and still, still are. The some are still out there. But, man, these guys were good. Their gardens look phenomenal, phenomenal. Mm. The produce coming out of there is just pristine. So they knew and have practices that goes back down how many years, right? Yeah. So we lost him, and I wasn't able to connect with him before he passed on. So I had just built my greenhouse. I was working on uh, my, my plot, my backyard, and my neighbor, one of my neighbors was, was watching me, and he says, hey, Jesse. He's kind of a big Italian guy, and he says, calls me up, a very strong Italian. He says, come over. And I went over, and and, and um, the wife of the husband who passed on was across on their yard, and she called, and he says, "Come over here." And so I went over, and he said, "Do you want to farm here?" And I said, "Yes." And his he asked the lady, "Hey, do you mind if he farms here?" And she's like, "No," and that was it. Wow, four thousand square feet of land right there. Fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. So we took on that that space and we've been farming on it ever since and it's it's fantastic having so between him and I we have about uh uh 6000 square feet just uh the two backyards. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. And yeah, so that was one and and when we started becoming more public with what we're doing taking over backyards and um a friend of mine came up and uh, helped me um if I'm, beginning of the season is always the busiest one, wheelbarrowing and everything. He was seeing how much work there is and did a video to show how this crazy thing that Jess is doing in his backyard. Mm-hmm. And we started getting phone calls and people saying, hey, I have a backyard. Hey, I have a backyard. Hey, I have a backyard. And my, I wanted to say, I wish I could have a, a tagline saying, are you tired of mowing the lawn? <laughs> 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 I will make food with it. Oh, are you tired it. of mowing your lawn? <laughs> well, call Jesse today at 905. <laughs> I will, yes, that would be the way to do it. You know, because people are tired of mowing the lawn and making the grass mm-hmm. look green and watering it and da 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 and then you got a weed and everything else. Yeah. So I was thinking about it, thinking, hey, I should just make a nice little ad and say, if oh, you're yeah. bored and really get done, <laughs> even shout, let's 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 grow food for other people. Oh. So uh, we'll soon listen to Emma's tomato segment, but yeah. before we do, um, we have a, an email here from Georgia, and uh, thank you, Breda, for emailing us, and she's asking about a website, and you do have a website. I do have a website. Um, it's actually I, I'll spell it out for you. It's Z A. W A D I dot farm F A R M Z A W A D I dot farm and okay. everything is there. I'm also on Instagram and all those links are on the site. And and Dave in Toronto is asking where the farm market is and and what months is it open. So I 
Um, uh, it's it's a high park market. That's where I go to mm -hmm. high park farmers market, and it's a uh, it's a fairly new one. Um, the one I started, I couldn't keep up because of, like I said, it was such a difficult space to uh, do a market. But it's still in the play of bringing it back. But I I do participate at uh, High Park Farmers Market. Okay, yeah. and that is is that year round or is that? No, it's not. It's okay. it's only the growing season. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Well, we'll uh, we'll just head towards Emma's tomato segment yep. here, and I should mention too, as a lead up to that that um, Emma has a blog out on the Harrow Smith Magazine website about uh, her latest blog is the Rumi Banjan Tomato. So you can check that out, harrowsmithmag.com. Uh, and on my own fig blog on stephenbiggs.ca, my most recent post is about um, the emails I get at this time of year, people who are freaked out because their figs are coming out of dormancy too soon. So if that's you, uh, you might want to uh, check out that blog. And, oh, big news is I do have a new fig book coming up soon, within the next couple months. And I'm really excited about it. If you're interested in knowing as soon as it comes out, just sign up for the newsletter on my website. And as soon as it's coming out, I'll be including that in my newsletter at stephenbiggs.ca. Now, if uh, it's that time of year when there's lots of gardening talks coming up, lots of gardening events, so I encourage everyone to get out to seed exchanges, meet other gardeners, uh, meet those people who can teach you things. And uh, Emma and I are going to be in Belton, Texas, February 15th and 16th at the Mother Earth News Fair. So if if any of our listeners are in Texas and you're down that way, we would absolutely love to meet you in person. So come say hi. And closer to home on the 8th of February, I'm at the Niagara City Saturday with Emma. And then Canada Blooms, the big show here in Toronto on March the 21st. Now for um, Emma's tomato segment, today you're going to hear a chat that I had with Emma last night uh, when she realized that she wouldn't be on today's show and she really wanted to share her excitement about some of these top tomato recommendations for those of you who are looking at getting seeds for this coming season. And you can find pictures of all the varieties she's talking about here by going to the Harrow Smith Magazine website, so harrowsmithmag.com. And uh, now, here is Emma talking about some really great tomatoes. It's so special at this time of the year for me when I come home from school... And I walk in the back door, I drop my backpack, and I see a seed catalog sitting on the dining room table at my spot. And when the first one comes in, it's amazing. And after that, it's just a continuous flow of seed catalogs. And I take them up to my bedroom, close my door, and pretty much hibernate with my seed catalogs. It's pretty awesome. I can just stay in my room for hours looking through, getting so excited about the growing season. It's one of my favorite things in the world, other than the actual growing. And you had one come today too, right? Oh my goodness. I had the Baker Creek Heirloom Seed full seed catalog, which means it's not only all the varieties that they have along with their amazing pictures and descriptions, but it includes stories of some really neat people and projects and vegetables as well. Hmm. Very nice. Well, let's talk about some top tomato seed varieties if people are starting to get catalogs or even shop online why don't we talk about some of your favorite varieties how about the ones that you've talked about in your harrow smith magazine blog sounds good harrow smith jr so i think your first one was the traveler's tomato and people might find that one under another name too right yeah you can find it under under the name reese tomat which is actually a german name which means traveler's tomato and pardon my very unprofessional german skills but i think that the name actually came from it's uh, um the way it looks and it kind of looks like a brain maybe or a whole bunch of cherry tomatoes fused together and the way that they're together, you can pull them up, pull off a segment without needing a knife, and there won't be juice squirting everywhere like if you tried it with any other tomato. So I think the idea of it was people on long journeys could just rip off a segment, enjoy it, and save some other parts of it for later. And so it's a really neat tomato. 
Now, in terms of cooking, um, I think it'd be best to use it in a sauce probably because it's a little bit tangy. It won't win any awards for sweetness. But mm -hmm. if you're trying to impress people with looks or something that's just really going to surprise them, this is a tomato to look for. And another neat thing about it is I read the story in this Baker Creek whole seed catalog a couple years ago. I have the red variety, but apparently there's also a white one and a pink one as well, which I oh, haven't wow. seen for sale anywhere, but I'm still looking. And it is really an ugly duckling, I have to say. And if people want to see pictures, uh, they can find your blog. If, the, if you Google Harrow Smith Magazine, and once you're on their website, just look up Emma Biggs, and you'll find her series. And under the, under the Rise of Tomat blog, you'll see a picture of this, and it, it's... It's weird, but I, I love it. I have to it. say I like it because I like the weird tomatoes. That's what gets me excited. That's my favorite part of going through the seed catalogs. I'll skip the orange carrot section and go straight to the purple carrots. Same mm -hmm. with tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so on that note, you also did a blog on one called Sunrise Bumblebee. And we had the breeder of Sunrise Bumblebee on a previous episode. So what should people know about that one? Well, this tomato variety was one that I found and I just absolutely love. I found it a few years ago and it's still one in that top few after growing over a couple hundred varieties of tomatoes now. And it's this little, um, maybe toony sized um, cherry tomato. Let me stop there. Sorry for our listeners outside of Canada. Oh, yeah. When you say toony size. So what? It's about an inch and a half yeah. tall, right? So it's a... Right, maybe, I guess, the regular size of a cherry tomato, mm -hmm. a medium-sized cherry tomato. It's a yellowy-orange color with these beautiful pinky-red stripes down the center, and it just looks so gorgeous. It's like a sunset in a tomato, and you think that you've fallen in love with it, and then you pop it in your mouth, and you realize that you've fallen completely in love because this tomato is so delicious. It's sweet, but it's not overly sweet. It's like the perfect balance of tomatoes. And when Fred was on our show, he said that his son was helping him with some of his tomato breedings. And his rule was never cross, only cross a good tasting tomato, or sorry, a great tasting tomato with a great tasting tomato. And that mm. definitely happened with Sunrise Bumblebee because it is incredible. Yeah, it does have good flavor. And I found that we picked some that were unripe just before that first fall frost. And even those ones that ripened in the house in less than perfect ripening conditions still had a really good flavor mm -hmm. compared to some of the other tomatoes we were ripening that were just quite bland at that point. Yeah, and I have to add too that Sunrise Bumblebee actually has sister tomatoes or brother tomatoes. There's pink bumblebee and purple bumblebee as well. They all have that beautiful striping, that incredible flavor. And so make sure that you look out, by, look out for those varieties because they're actually... Uh, pretty easy to find in many different seed sources. Okay. Now, Harrow Smith blog number three, I think, you did yellow currant. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's probably, what, the most prolific tomato in the garden, is that? Oh, my goodness. This tomato, it makes me think of grapes because you, when you ever you see a grapevine, it's just completely loaded and there's just these trusses of tomatoes. That's what yellow currant is like. And they're not big like grapes, though. They're the size of peas. And so you have these little pea-sized tomatoes with this incredibly thick skin. And the thing about the thick skin is some people don't like the fact that it has a thick skin, but me taking tomatoes to, my, to school in my lunch bag, they get shaken around a lot. And so mm. tomatoes with a thick skin will not crack. And so that's why this is one of my favorite varieties. Not only is it incredibly prolific, but I don't have tomato juice everywhere when I get to school. So it's a very kid-friendly tomato, perfect mm -hmm. for school lunches. Or that's adults yellow. taking it to school to work for the day. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's yellow currant. Now, another small tomato that uh, our friend Sonia Day, who used to write for Toronto Star, introduced us to is Matt's Wild Cherry. What can you tell me about that one? Well, whenever I think about this variety, Sonia's article always comes to mind. And it's an article that she wrote called A Tomato That Can Practically Grow on Mars. And that's because of its incredible disease resistance. And other than that, it 
has a really thin skin, which some people like having that thin skin, and it has an incredible flavor. I absolutely love the flavor of Matt's Wild Cherry, and it is really productive as well. It's a little bit bigger than Yellow Currant, but it's not as big as Sunrise Bumblebee, so it's a perfect size for snacking, and it is so delicious. Mm, okay, and so um, that one too, at Harrowsmith Magazine, Google their website, find the blog, you can find pictures of it. Now, you also wrote a blog about a tomato called House. And that's our friend Linda Crago, who's been on the show before, and she will definitely be on the show again to talk tomatoes. But she told us about that one last spring. So well, tell us about House. Yeah, well, my favorite, one of my favorite events of the year is going to Linda's um, tomato seedling sale in the spring. And it's like a magical place for me because you're in this... Um, in her f yard and there's just a ton of tomato plants. There's hundreds of tomato plants, every variety you could imagine. And you're surrounded by other people who love tomatoes. So it can't get much better than that, can it? And so I go up to Linda and I ask her, what are some things you think I should try? What are some of the weirdest things that you've got? And one of the things that she gives me is this house tomato. And the neat thing about it is it only gets about a foot and a half to two feet tall at most. And it'll produce an abundance of little red, I'll say loony this size, mm -hmm. loony this time sized red cherry tomatoes, which have a nice flavor. And so if you're looking for a really small, compact variety that you can either put in containers on maybe a patio or a deck, or even if you want to grow them inside where you have a lot of light, you can do that too. Okay. So that's house. And, and we had them growing out the side of straw bales in our straw bale garden on the driveway. So it really is a compact little tomato. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay, you wrote about garden peach. Tell us about that. Well, you know, you always think that you're going to, you're, you always, you see a red regular tomato and you think it's pretty cool. And then you see a purple one and you think it's pretty cool. But then you see one that's fuzzy and you're like, what is going on here? What has happened to this tomato? Is this normal? Well, it turns out it is with this variety called garden peach. And I've grown a few other one weird fuzzy ones since then. And it is a lot like a peach color wise. It's a, it's a peachy color mm -hmm. and it's um, like a very light pink with a little bit of orangey red blushing on it. It looks really good. Um, it's about the size of a golf ball, sometimes a little bit bigger. It's pretty prolific and the flavor is really nice. It's a mild flavor, but it's sweet. It's a, one of the most delicious tomatoes I've tasted, but it looks amazing and feels amazing too. Yeah, it, you really do feel that fuzz on it when you pick it up. Yeah, it's almost like it may be picking up a tennis ball. And mm -hmm. I took, the funny thing is, I took a photo of one another fuzzy tomato that I grew this summer and I was show, showed my mom and she said it looks like it's covered in dust and that's actually the fuzz. Hmm. Okay, so another tomato that you blogged about has been purple calabash and we actually we talked to Linda Crego about this yeah. when we were writing gardening with Emma mm -hmm. and uh, she was talking about the flavor of it so tell us about the flavor and about purple calabash well I always think um, about Linda when I think about this variety because this is one variety that I think she talks up a lot and I sure love it because it's one of those tomatoes that's really weird and it's one of the better known weird ones and it's basically a flattened ribbed um, so ribbed kind of means segmented purpley red tomato. It's a, like a uh, burgundy with a bit of a darker purple tone mm. to it. And I find it's really productive for me and the flavor is really nice. It's sweet, but it's also, it's got that really classic tomato flavor that we love, except it's a little bit more sweet than some of the other ones. I just love it. And I think it looks really beautiful. I've heard, Linda said that she gave it to someone once and they thought that it was ugly. But I think it's all all a perspective thing, and I think it's a pretty awesome tomato. Oh, it's beautiful. And it, it's another one in the fall when all those green tomatoes were ripening in our basement. We had tons of purple calabash. Yeah. They had a nice taste. And I think Linda described the taste as having just a slight smokiness. Mm -hmm. and, and it definitely is different from a lot of other tomatoes but it's lovely yes i yeah. sure love it and its production though is incredible it's definitely one of the most impressive i've grown mm -hmm. 
Okay, so I think we have one last one that you blogged about for Harrow Smith Magazine, and that's, I don't know how to pronounce this one, Rumi Banjan? Is well, that... you know what? I don't know how to pronounce this one either, because I actually picked it up at a seed swap when we were, I forget where, but we were at the CD Saturday event, and of course I went to, straight to the tomato section of the seed swap, and I found this, and I'm like... I have no idea what this is, but I want more tomato seeds. <laughs> so I picked it up, brought it home, I grew it last year. I had no idea what to expect. And it was one of the most amazing, most memorable tomatoes in my garden last year. And what it is, it's like purple calabash, shape-wise, flattened, um, ribbed, deeply ribbed. But th the production was incredible. I'd pick so many of these tomatoes, it just blew me away. But then also the coloring on it, it's this ye very light yellowy orange color with this dark reddy pink marbling on the inside and you see it mostly around the bottom. It just looks amazing, it's kind of like a sunset like Sunrise Bumblebee except it's big, it's ribbed, it's so incredible, it just blew me away. Mm -hmm. That's one, mm -hmm. one tomato I'm never going to forget. Well, so. That's a, a neat list that we've gone through because we've got different colors, we have different shapes, we have different sizes. And why don't we finish off by um, just tell me a little bit about what your next blog is going to be about. And, and people, of course, can get more when the blog comes out. But what tomato are you doing and what excites you about it? So spoiler alert, spoiler alert, the next one is a variety called White Wonder. And so there are actually no other white ones on this list. But White Wonder is another one that sticks up there with Rumi Banjan on some of my top lists from this past year. And it's another one that's flattened. Um, it's less ribbed, it has maybe two or three ribs on most fruit. And the fruits are incredibly uniform. Sometimes you get um, bigger sized tomatoes and you'll get lots of different shapes and sizes, but these ones are all almost the same, same size, same shape. The flavor is more mild, slightly sweet, but the production, oh my goodness, it just blew me away. I have a picture that I took during the summer and it's all the tomatoes I harvested in a day. And about a quarter of those are white wonder tomatoes off, that's, two plants out of my over 100 plants. It was amazing. Very prolific. Okay, well that's Tomato Talk with Emma for January. And because you can't be on the show for the January show, you've got school commitments. Uh, do you have any tomato seed selecting pointers to share with listeners? Well, I'd like to say that you can't have too many tomato plants. Because I've never had too many tomato plants. <laughs> I mean, they've kind of gone a little bit crazy some year and chaotic, but I kind of love that. So go through the seed catalogs, ask your friends what varieties they recommend, go and listen to some people speak about growing tomatoes or weird vegetables, and just pick up some seeds at a seed swap, share the seeds that you've saved so that everyone can grow some neat tomatoes this year. Okay, and that was my chat with Emma about tomatoes. And Emma says, hi, everyone. And she plans to be back here in the studio next month. And um, before Jesse and I resume talking about market gardening, we just had a couple more emails come in. And uh, John emailed in, just wondering about growing tips uh, from Jesse uh, for urban backyards and vegetables. Any That's thoughts? That's a very, very good question. And what I would like to say before I jump to what types of veggies and everything else, the number one thing I would say is know your soil. Very important. If you can do soil tests, please do. There are very many easy kits you can have online and just really understand the soil type you have. That is so vital. So, because what I do, I use organic practices. I can't be certified organic because of it's a backyard. Um, but I use 100% organic practices. Means I don't add any fertilizers that are chemical induced or for, uh, uh, anything that's not natural. So, understanding my soil was the number one thing I had to focus on. So, getting fresh compost was a deal. Getting um, any soil amendments that you need for the soil ahead of planting. Uh, lasagna gardening was one of the things I learned to do. So there are many ways you can rehabilitate your soil first. Once you get your soil good enough, you can choose whatever plants you grow. I We grow um, uh, seasonal vegetables, so root veg and leafy veg uh, for mm -hmm. the season. Uh, but my number one thing I recommend, please, 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 first learn and understand your soil. Grow it, actually. Okay. Grow your soil. Yeah. Grow your soil. And yeah. then we were talking earlier about 
Growing the biology in your soil, Absolutely. fostering those microbes. Yeah. Yes, so we, we, we practice a no-till method. So what that means is we don't use a rotor tiller on our land, even if you're getting a fresh uh, backyard. We don't till it at all. Mm-hmm. Um, what we do is we flip the grass upside down on itself, mm-hmm. and then we put cardboard on top of that, and we cover it for maybe a month. And what that does, it inoculates pretty much the whole place and the worms will be more active in it. Mm. And the next thing we do before we plant, we add any soil amendments on top of that. So we add the compost and we make our beds on top of that compost and we grow on that. Okay. And any pathos that we have, we add uh, we add some, uh, either we can add cardboards on top of that to suppress any weeds that might come up or we can add... Um, uh, uh, sawdust if you want but not really that fine but you know wood chips would be good to add in the middle there so just to minimize anything that will come up and, and be a problem for you in the future um, and then we, we landscape fabric whatever we're not using we cover so okay. soil is never exposed so that's keeping kind of those weeds in check. keeping those weeds down and the best thing to do the more you do that the less weeds will come up in, in time and the more compost you add you're adding layers of good um, microbiology underneath it so um, yeah, so there are many tricks and trips I can mm-hmm. talk to, and I can talk forever about it. But yeah, there's there's means and ways to make it that it works well, that you don't have to worry about um, what type of, uh, you know, what do I do, what do I grow? Okay. So I just will respond. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Um, a nice email from Jeff just to say, glad to hear about the fig book coming up. Jeff, thanks for the shout out. And um, we have an email from Gloria. Gloria is saying, fantastic show. Thanks, Gloria. I'm really enjoying this show. (laughs) And a great guest. Definitely need more farmers in and close to our cities. I bet the produce tastes absolutely delicious. I I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I was telling Steve earlier that my daughter wakes up and I find in the greenhouse with with a shirt full of tomatoes. Uh, She's testing them. It's kind of cool. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. It's awesome. And uh, James has emailed in to ask, what produce do you sell? So um, the selling part is I do CSA, which is Community Supported Agriculture. So the way we practice that is the people who pay us to grow food for them. So what type of produce do we grow? We rotate between root vegetables, so carrots, Mm -hmm. beets, uh, turnips, things like that, and with leafy vegetables, spinach, kale, Swiss chard, etc. So we rotate those uh, throughout the season. Okay. And, but they're not just those specific types. We have many, many more because we grow, we harvest about 9 to 12 crops uh, every two weeks. Okay. And we rotate a lot of that. So we, there's a lot of uh, plots that we go through the rotation. I think that's, we're going to talk about that soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then... Uh, yeah, that's what we do. And, and I think your tomatoes had just wrapped up when I was there in oh October, right? Oh my gosh, those things will not stop. I had to, <laughs> actually, I had, I had to pull them out. There was, there was too much. Um, we, and my daughter, I was actually in, in, she was not happy with me for a whole week. She was really not impressed. I was pulling tomatoes out. Huh? But I was preparing for winter. And what we do in the winter in the greenhouse, we grow, um, we put radishes in there. So when the winter killed, they actually keep the soil moist and ready for mm. for, for spring. But she she was not in that frame of mind of losing her tomatoes. But, uh, yeah, tomatoes we grow. Uh, we do also um, the hot – we did peppers in the greenhouse, which is great sweet peppers we did in the greenhouse. And arugula and spinach in the greenhouse just changes just the texture. They're softer. Uh, they the just, just they taste amazing inside. But the outside also – they have they have different flavors, you know. In the elements, mm-hmm. they taste different than that. Um and then we are, um, this year I'm coming in with uh, ginger and I want to also grow, uh, I got ginger coming in and cucumbers. Yeah, I okay. really want to get cucumbers so bad. Mm. So yeah, we're going to have some, some cucumbers in the greenhouse. Really excited about that. Love the sound of that. Mm-hmm. Okay, I've got lots I want to ask you and the clock's ticking, but I want to okay. jump to the Broad Fork dance, <laughs> which I, I saw on your website because <laughs> I just thought it was so neat to see music mixed in oh, with man. market gardening. Tell us about so, well, what's a broad fork, first okay. of all, yeah, and yeah, then gonna, what, was, what is this dance? Oh, man. So, as I said, crazy ideas, right? Um, so, I was every time I go to a farm, there's this tool that's used. So, anyone who's doing market gardening and doesn't do heavy tilling, every time you want to use the space, the, the row that you have, it could be 100 feet, 50 feet long, or whatever length it is, and it's three feet wide, there's this fork that literally straddles the whole bed. And the idea is you, you st- it has 
uh, forks that go south of it, and then you have two handles that you can stand in between, and you can stand on the fork. And for it to to uh, to go in the ground, you have to straddle the two, and then you have to go left and right, left and right, left and right, left and right as as the, as the fork goes down into the ground, and then you peel back the soil. But the idea you're not you're not lifting the soil too far up. You're not you're not you're not uh, um, you're not inverting it. You're not inverting the soil. You just you just aerating the soil, just adding air to it. And you actually sometimes you can actually hear it come in. We have the black we have the cotton soil, so you can actually hear the. <sighs> into mm. the soil, which is a really cool thing. But anyway, so you, you straddle it, and every time people do it, there's a dance to it. <laughs> it's like a little buck dance. You know, you can left, right, left, right, left, right. And everybody has their own. But I was thinking, man, would it be cool to get a bunch of market gardeners doing this funny butt dance on the broad fork, <laughs> put some music to it. And uh, I'm collecting videos. So any, if, you, if you guys know anyone who's a market gardener out there and wants to... Uh, to uh, send me a video, you can find me on my website zawadi.farm, and just email me. Just just take a video and just show me how you can get on the fork, go left and right, left and right, and just just do that. So I, I, I did a time lapse one, which is kind of cool. You can see me just stuff from one side of the far, the bed and go all the way down. Uh, so I've got some some responses. It's kind of cool to see other farmers jump in. So I have a broad fork at home. Oh, get and, on it, buddy! Uh, you know I can't say my dancing is <laughs> worth putting on video, but maybe I'll do you it just for shake fun. It. Yeah. Uh, you can you can do it. You can do it. Get in there. Uh, but yeah, I want to get there. I want to get this uh, broad fork dance and just it, the the bigger picture for me is to highlight the 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 how we nurture our soil. Right? We're not trying to 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 extract from it. We're trying to grow it. Mm. Right, and the more we grow our soil, the produce just is is a byproduct of it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we're not trying to extract nutrients. Actually, we are adding and growing the soil, and everything we're harvesting from it is just a byproduct of us nurturing the soil that we have. So anyway, that's all. That's all it is. The broad folk dance, and oh man, I can't wait to finish it because it's gonna be hilarious. That will be fun. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, we have a nice uh, email in from Michelle. She's uh, thanks for saying it's a fantastic show and just asking again okay. about your website. And let's spell it out for okay. everyone. Z-A-W-A-D-I. I'll say it again. Z-A-W-A-D-I dot farm. The last is F-A-R-M. So Zawadi dot farm. And we want to remind people Z we say up here in Canada, which is Z, the letter Z. And uh, just so folks okay. like down there know. C-A-W-A-D-I. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. Gary's translating because he's American. So, uh, well, and Canadian, but still, <laughs> I, I didn't know what Zed was initially. Well, I'm when Kenyan, I, so we, yeah. we, we sell Zed. Yeah. Okay. You know. And Michelle, if you have a Broad Fork dance, you're welcome to send that <laughs> in too. So let's, um, let's just talk about kids because I'm so impressed yes. to hear about your kids working with you. I'm impressed with your kid. Are you kidding me? This is great, Emma. Um, yeah, we um, like I said when you and I talked about the the, the, the transition space and 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 part of the you know I, I shared about the book that I wrote um, and the, the, I wrote I wrote to it to explain and to show what my journey was from farming into tech and one of the pieces that I was sharing with you earlier was that my daughter when I was traveling too much I wasn't home a lot and I was I was all these things she had a a little bit of a stranger look at me kind of a face, and, and it tore me to shreds. So farming has given me the opportunity to be present, which is one of the things I really appreciate, is if they're mm -hmm. talking to me, I don't have to be anywhere. If they're sharing with me or if they're present with me at the farm, I am there. I'm not thinking about, because we, I, as you understand with crop planning, once you plan your farm for the season, You've planned your farm for the season, so you just you just farm. Yeah. So I'm I'm so when they're with me and I'm and I'm lifting wheelbarrows and she comes home and she's like, hey, Dad, can I talk to you? I just put the wheelbarrow down and we we talk. So, and my son is also that inquisitive mind of of and he's he's kind of deep sometimes and it takes me to a. <laughs> I had to go back and do it's my research. It's amazing how kids can do that. Yeah, he came yeah. home one day and said, Dad, are we in a food desert? And I was like, Kid, what? And we actually. We, he was actually in, in, he was he was invited to go to a a school to present about food deserts, and we spent a good chunk. Um, I always like doing deep dives with him. If you ask me a question I don't understand, we go and do a deep dive. So we spend mm -hmm. a day, a weekend, just digging into this topic we don't know. So we did this whole thing about um, about uh, food deserts and. 
And I watched him present this to his peers. And I remember just looking at him thinking, I got this all wrong. I think I'm trying to solve something instead of I should be teaching my kids. And Because when he's teaching his kids, his friends, his peers, mm -hmm. it's not that he's teaching. They're actually having a conversation. Mm. And the conversation is, 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 a friend of mine called it tennis, is it's lobbied on one side. And when you receive it, you respond back too. And that's what was happening between this strange, they, he never met students in that class. And here they are, he's presenting about food deserts. They don't understand what that is. But they were slowly coming to understand it by asking va like really valid questions of, so what do you mean by that? Do you mean it is? And I don't understand what that looks like. Does it look like this? And when, when you say looks like this, is it what I'm seeing when I go home? And it, and it was such a meaningful conversation. I actually got really emotional just locking, looking at this, thinking I miss this kind of conversation. So my focus has now been if they are present and they want to bring their friends to mm. spend time with me at the, in the back, come on down. I'm doing commercial farming. So I'm going to, uh, I'm selling this stuff. But if they're coming in and they want to see how it's done, I'm not going to stop them. Yeah. Come on down, let's let's learn. And the more, as you've seen it also with your kids, the more they engage in it, it's it's a different light from their side. The reflection is completely different. It's mm -hmm. almost full color. I see. I almost think I see black and white, and my kids see in full color. And and it's such a neat thing when they when they describe it to me what they see. I wish I had those eyes because it's. And I think we need more of this. Uh, partaking and giving all this information to those who need it, especially the kids of kids, especially because they take it to another level that we'd never thought of. Another level, and they have an optimism that maybe sometimes we've lost. You I was telling about you about yeah. Emma's tomato sale, where I said to her, <clears throat> "I don't think your neighbors will buy your transplants," <laughs> and she gave me a business plan, and she said, "Yes, I think they will," and she sold every last plant. Imagine so. that. That optimism. It's big. It's big. And one thing I think we, you, we alluded to earlier though I talked to you, we were, I was saying I'm trying and I'm learning to listen more than to respond with my adult brain and say, no, that may not work because of, because of, because of, mm -hmm. and being the block myself. So what I, I'm glad Emma stood up and said, no, you say no, but I think it's going to work out. So here's the reason what I think it is. So I, th I think for me, my journey has been to, tell the kids this is how much I see this for, for the much of my brain capacity this is where I've reached but I promise you you see you will see way more than I do and if you do please let me know yes. <laughs> come teach yeah. me come let me know what's going on and it's been ideal that way and it's it's a back and forth uh, tennis match between my kids and I where we understand each other and we respect each other's perspective and learn to listen more that's my biggest thing in the past four years is to learn to really listen, even to the people I'm talking to, or even to my kids, and just spend time listening. And when I respond, I actually find that I have a better flavor conversation with them because I hear what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And the inputs are sometimes really valid. One, one example I had is, uh, which was a big one. Um, uh, we were building the greenhouse, uh, and it was in the freezing cold Canadian Toronto, what was it, February or March? It was in March. Very cold, and I called in all favors. I called in all my friends. Guys, I'm building a greenhouse. This thing needs to go up because our growing season is coming. I need to be done. Yeah. So all my friends are here, and we were building the base of the greenhouse. And the way it was done, like I said, we were not building a uh, 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 a, st a permanent structure. In Toronto, you can't do that. It's against the law. You can't do that. But we tried to build something that's not permanent yet sturdy. So when we're building it, uh, so you lay out all the pieces out. We have all these, these huge metal pieces all on the ground. Lay them all out to understand how it's going to look like. And now we're getting the base of the structure down. And we, we get this, this four and a half feet T-bars. We're driving down the ground and then drilling it into the base of the structure. And we're setting it all up. And then my son, who was like, dude, go back inside. It's cold. And my friend, Trisha, thank, oh, God, bless, I love this girl. She's a friend of mine. She said, don't do that. Let him be here. In fact, she gave him a hammer and said, go, go nail something. Uh. <laughs> and she gave him the drill, go drill something. I'm thinking, no, get, get him inside, it's cold. But anyway, when she gave me that opportunity to stand back and just watch him do his thing, um, he actually found a, a huge error we had made. So he was walking down the base of the place and found out that the T-bars, the way we had laid them out, 
the structure was going to be all wrong. And if we went ahead with it, we had to tear down the whole thing and start from scratch. Wow. He saved the project. So the eyes of a child. Saved the whole project. That greenhouse stands. And every time I look at it, I'm reminded, just shut up, Jesse, and listen to your child. What a good lesson. <laughs> huge. What a good lesson. Huge. Yeah. Uh, so we're almost ready to wrap up, but I think it, before we finish up, I really want to ask if you have final words for people who are thinking about market gardening and, and thinking about a career change. A huge one. Oh there, and I, I know you might say you need to be crazy because you yes, started out saying you, you that earlier. You do need that. You do need that little bit of craziness because anyway, um, oh, wow, that's a good question. What do you need to do? So in, initially I said, yes, be crazy and do it, but my best, uh, what, really helped me was find local growers in your area. Walking distance, five minute, ten minute, look, find them. They're there. They're there. Somebody is growing food there. Sorry, that's my mm-hmm. alarm for my, for my pick up my kids. Ah. So uh, find local growers who are doing what you want to do, I guess. Yes. And they, one thing I, tr- I did, so I found uh, a growing operation around my place. Uh, at, luckily, it was uh, a company called Fresh City Farms. And two of my friends who I love dearly work there. So that was mm-hmm. Hannah Hunter and Julianne Keach. And um, they allowed me to understand what it is farming and getting my hands dirty, getting lifting those wheelbarrows full of compost, and, you know, broad forking and harvesting and tilling, or just really understanding what that looks like. Because it sounds, when you say market garden, it looks, it sounds very beautiful, doesn't it? It has that... Uh, it does. The joie de vivre, it sounds, that's so beautiful. You know, I can do that. It sounds easy. But it is work. It is, it is, I'm up at 4 a.m. sometimes and I'm out in the land because I, I love it. My, my blood boils if I'm not in the land. Mm. So I would say, try it out. If, if you don't have the space, get a small little... Um, bucket filled up with with good compost. I'm sure you can find some good organic compost. Put some seeds in, and just work through that. And then online, there are some phenomenal courses. You find if you can Google uh, Curtis Stone, C U R T I S, the Urban Farmer. Tons of resources that he's put up that really educates you on the simplicity of farming. And if you're growing on on large scale, also on the commercial side of things or my size, I mean, it's still valued to show that. Mm-hmm. But just Try it out yourself. Work it out yourself. But first, start by learning how to grow soil. Very vital. Okay. And once you get that, I mean, you can get now into bigger. Um, you can now de- determine what kind of operation you want to have. Um, and then if you really want to go crazier than that, call up a couple friends say, hey, what can I grow for you guys for the next five months in the growing season? And then you can challenge yourself and say, okay, I'm going to grow tomatoes for my friends. And run that. It's a challenge for yourself if you want to do it right. And if you need resources, I know a friend called Emma. She will help you to grow good tomatoes. But yeah. anyway. <laughs> okay. But yeah. Jesse. Just try it out. Thank you very much for no, coming in you. today. And uh, with with all the emails that came in, I feel you've inspired a lot of people out there. And Let's certainly you've inspired me. So. Oh, thank you. No, no I'm, I'm like I said, when I saw your daughter doing this, I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, this is what I want. So, yeah, let's keep growing. Okay, Mm -hmm. good. Well, the Garage Gardeners radio show is just about over for today. So a a big thanks again to Jesse from Zawadi Farm, zawadi.farm. Correct. And uh, if you have ideas for guests for future shows, people who push boundaries, please do send your ideas through stephenbiggs.ca, my website, or connect with us on Instagram. Emma's there as Emma Biggs underscore, underscore grows. And uh, I'm there as Garage Gardeners. If you use Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Play, you can find us there. Please subscribe, please rate, and please like. You're listening to the Garage Gardeners radio show. I'm Stephen Biggs. Thank you for listening to the Garage Gardeners radio show with your host, Stephen Biggs and Emma Biggs, right here on Reality Radio 101.